because I'll I'll start acting that way. Okay. 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 So welcome everyone to this live event here on YouTube. I'm Katerina Anthony and I work with the Atlas Collaboration. This is the sixth live talk that we've had here on the YouTube channel um, on various physics subjects involved in the Atlas experiment. And this talk will be on the Higgs boson. And of course it comes at a very timely time. We're coming up to the ninth discovery anniversary of the Higgs boson. That will be this Sunday, the 4th of July. And so uh, Dr. Hong Tao Yang will be giving the talk today on the Higgs. He's been a member of the Atlas Collaboration since 2010, and he received his PhD degree from the University of Wisconsin in 2016. He's now a Chamberlain Postdoctoral Fellow at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, obviously in the United States. Dr. Yang contributed to the discovery of the Higgs as a junior graduate student. And since then, he's played several important roles in various Higgs boson property measurements, many of which I hope he'll be sharing with us today. So uh, Dr. Yang, if you'd like to start sharing your slides, I look forward to your talk. And um, I'll just tell everybody while you get those ready that we'll be taking questions. And so if you have any about the Higgs or specifically um, about anything covered in the talk, then um, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them then. Okay, take it away. Okay, thank you, Katarina, for the, for the very nice introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Welcome to the Atlas Physics, Physics Live on YouTube today. So we are going to discuss one very famous particle, the Higgs boson. In the next one hour or so, we are going to review the exciting history of Higgs boson discovery. We are also going to discuss our current understanding of the Higgs boson and also the next steps uh, we are, we are going to, uh, how, how we are going to study uh, this further. So in case you are wondering where I am, I'm currently, currently at Berkeley in California, USA, and I'm working for the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, as Katarina just mentioned. So from this picture, you can see that our lab has a very nice view of the San Francisco Bay. And for the hardcore fans of particle physics, you probably know that Berkeley was the birthplace for the cyclotron. So it was invented by Ernest Lawrence, and it was also him who founded the Berkeley lab. And since we are going to talk about Atlas experiment today, uh, let me also explain to you where it is uh, in case you do not know it yet. So it is at the European Organization for Nuclear Research or better known as CERN. So CERN is definitely the center of particle physics uh, these days. Uh, it is the host of the famous Large Hadron Collider as well as other many important uh, research facilities. So this picture and also my uh, virtual Zoom background is showing you the square in front of CERN. Uh, so you can easily reach to CERN by public transportation once you get to uh, Geneva in Switzerland. So here you can check out the Microcosm Museum and the, all, as well as the uh, Globe of Science and Innovation, which is this spherical building here. So both are very fun and they are free of charge for the public. And our experiment, the Atlas experiment is just behind this globe. Okay, so now let's come to the physics. Uh, as we know from our school textbook, uh, everything around us, a book, a table, or a car, or whatever you name it, uh, is composed of uh, basic, particle, uh, basic particles called atoms. And if we take a closer look at the atom, for example, we have a helium atom here. You can then see that uh, it contains uh, electrons orbiting around a, around a very tiny nucleus. So the electron is actually belonging to a larger particle family uh, called the lepton. And we are going to discuss uh, other members of this lepton family later. Uh, and, but if we come back to the nucleus, it can be further broken down into proton and the neutron. And if we use some really sophisticated equipment to, to probe into the structure of the proton or the neutron, you can find out that they contain three quarks. So these quarks can be classified into two types called the up type and the down type. So proton contains two up quark and one down quark, while neutron contains one up quark and the two down quark. Uh, so 
So the leptons and the quarks are the basic building blocks of, the, of our world as we know today. Uh, and the, the up quark, down quark, and the electron are the so-called first generation uh, particles that make up our everyday matter. Of course, if there's a first generation, there's also second and the third generation. So compared with uh, first generation, those second and third generation counterparts are basically the same as the first generation, except that uh, they are heavier one generation after the other. Uh, and also those higher generation particles are unstable and they will quickly decay into the lower generation particles once produced. For example, muon has the same electric charge as the electron, uh, but it is 200 times uh, heavier. And once it is produced, it will quickly decay into electron uh, as well as neutrinos. So since I talked about the neutrino here, uh, let me also quickly mention that the neutrinos are very in interesting and also mysterious particles. So they are very light and they basically do not interact with uh, anything. So instead of decaying from higher generation to lower generation, neutrinos will simply oscillate between those generations as, as it travel. So as of today, we still know very little about uh, those uh, neutrino particles, but for today's discussion, we only need to remember that uh, it belongs to the lepton family. So all the 12 particles I'm showing you here in this chart has been, uh, have been discovered by experiments and the several discoveries have led to Nobel prizes in physics. But only having the building blocks of the world is not enough. We also need to introduce interactions, interactions between them or forces uh, between them. So from our daily life, uh, we have experience with a large variety of forces which appear to be very different from each other. But uh, if, with some physics insight, we would actually realize that uh, many of them are just uh, different representations of the same underlying force. So let's start from two forces we are familiar with. So we all have experience with the magnetic force when we play with a magnet. And we all have experience with the electric force when we see lightning or other electrical phenomena uh, in our life. So these two forces have very different behaviors, of course, but a great physicist like uh, Michael Faraday and James Maxwell found that they are the same force called the electromagnetic force. They have also introduced the idea of the force field to explain the propagation of the force. Now, this is something probably already known to you uh, because it was in the textbook. But what if I tell you that uh, the electromagnetic force and the force that caused the radioactive decay of the nucleus, what, uh, is what we refer to as weak force, is also as a just different representation of the same force called, the, called electroweak force. So this may sound very unreal, but it is also true. And the leading physicist who proposed this theory, uh, Sheldon Glashow, Abdas Salam and uh, Steven Weinberg won the Nobel Prize in 1979 uh, due to their uh, contribution uh, to building up this theory. So, but this is still not the end. We have also expanded our theory uh, to further exp explain the strong force that uh, confines the quarks within proton and also confines the proton and the neutron within the tiny nucleus. Uh, so the theory that explains both the electroweak and the strong force uh, is called the standard model. So, so the standard model still cannot explain gravity as well as some other mysteries we are going to come to later. So it's definitely not a theory of everything, but it's still quite impressive that we can use this single theory to explain phenomena ranging from our daily life all the way to the subatomic world. So in the language of uh, modern physics, uh, the force are propagated by the force carrier particles are listed here. So those are the quantum particles that, are, that is corresponding to the force field. And the interaction or the interaction between the two particles happens uh, by exchanging those uh, force carrier particles, just like we throw and catching a frisbee. Uh, so the electromagnetic force is propagated by photon, which is a basic unit of light. So photon is massless and the travel at the speed of light. Therefore, it can propagate the electrom electromagnetic force very far, even to infinity in, prin uh, in principle. And the weak force that causes the radioactive decay of the nucleus, on the other hand, is confined with a very small range. So this is uh, because they are propagated by very heavy particles like called W boson and Z boson. So it is like throwing an iron ball and you cannot uh, push it very far. 
And the strong force is a yet another force, uh, which is very strange. It is propagated by a particle called a gluon. So gluon is also massless uh, as photon, but its peculiar proper, uh, property is that it will also interact with itself, while photon will not. So the behavior of the strong force is yet very different compared with the electromagnetic force or the weak force. So when two quarks are getting very close to each other, they actually do not feel the strong force as if they are completely free particles. But as long as they try to get away, the strong force will kick in to make sure that they stick together. So this force may sound very far away from our daily life, but uh, it is actually the force that is responsible for producing sunshine for Earth. And it may also solve our energy problem in the future because this is a force that enables the nuclear fusion. Okay, so why I told you that uh, the Electroweak theory is true. It is because that we have found uh, the W and the Z bosons that propagate the, uh, the weak, weak field. So it is discovered by the UA1 and the UA2 experiments at the CERN super proton synchrotron uh, in 1983. So you can find the picture of these two experiments here. So this discovery is considered as a major victory of the standard model. And the Nobel Prize was immediately awarded to two leading experimentalists, uh, Carlo Rubia and Simon van der Meer, uh, the next year after the discovery was made. So coming back to these two particles, I, indeed we find them uh, very, very heavy after we discover them. In fact, uh, they are even heavier uh, than the iron items. Uh, and for other force carrier particles, uh, photon and gluon, they have also been confirmed in experiments. So we have also discovered all these four force carrier particles. So, so far, this sounds like uh, just another uh, cliche uh, success story of science. So everything predicted by scientists have been found and the chapter uh, of standard model seems, seems can be closed. Uh, but uh, if you were one of those great physicists who, write down, who wrote down the theory, uh, you will very soon find out that your, if your theory only contains those particles we just discussed, then it has a very big problem. The problem is that your theory is not self-consistent unless all these particles are massless and, and travels at the speed of light. So this is, of course, nonsense. We just discussed that the WZ bosons are heavy and the, there are good reasons to be so. And of course, all the building block uh, particles should have mass Otherwise, we won't even exist. So this actually uh, reminds me of a joke from the TV series Big Bang Theory. So a farmer raised some chicken who don't lay eggs. So he asked the a physicist for help. So the physicist did some calculation and then told the farmer that, well, I have a solution for you, but it is only working for a spherical chicken in the vacuum. Uh, so when I was an undergrad student at the Peking University, we loved this joke so much that we put this spherical chicken on our t-shirt. This is actually not only a joke, but also a reminder to ourselves that the physics is in the end supposed to explain the real world, not the hypothetical one. Of course, the real world physicists are also are very responsible people. They did, they did not just sleep on this problem. So actually, as early as in 1960s, even before the electroweak theory was confirmed by experiment, six physicists, including uh, Robert Brott, uh, Francois Englert, Peter Higgs, uh, Gerald Gruenig, and uh, Carl Hagen and uh, Tom Keeble, already independently proposed the solution to solve this problem. So the solution is to introduce yet another field called the Higgs field. And the, and the elementary particles will then gain their masses through interaction with the Higgs field. And yes, you did not hear me wrong. I'm telling you that the mass is not an intrinsic property of the elementary particle. Instead, it has to be provided by the Higgs boson field, by the Higgs field, sorry. So this is again very counterintuitive because mass seems to be such a natural property of every object we run into. But since every time we introduce a breakthrough in, in physics, we have some counterintuitive thing. Let's stay open-minded for now and see what this theory is telling us. So if you look at this animation, uh, at, the, at the beginning when the universe is created, every particle is massless uh, as we just mentioned. So we have a up quark and a photon and an and a electron here, and they are all traveling at the speed of light. But very shortly after the universe was created, the Higgs field kicks in, and then now the up quark and the electron will slow down because they have gained mass from interacting with the Higgs field. Well, photon 
does not interact with the Higgs field. Therefore, it will remain massless and travel at the speed of light. Okay, uh, so, so just like uh, other, uh, other uh, fields, uh, the Higgs field is also having a corresponding quantum particle called Higgs boson. So with Higgs boson introduced uh, in, the, in the standard model, we finally have a self-consistent theory that explains not only the building blocks of our world, but also the basic in interactions except for the gravity. And from our discussions just now, you can see that Higgs boson is really at the center of standard model, uh, responsible, for responsible for providing mass uh, to all these particles. So in order to establish standard model as a, as a successful theory or prove that the standard model is wrong, we have to conclude on whether Higgs boson exists or not. Uh, so uh, as we just mentioned, uh, all these elementary particles will gain their mass uh, through interacting with Higgs field. Therefore, the Higgs boson will either have direct or indirect uh, interactions with all these standard model particles we just discussed. And we can make use of it to try to create the Higgs boson. For example, we can uh, collide two proton or two electron. And as, as long as the, the energy of the collision is correct, we will then be able to create a Higgs boson. And the Higgs boson is expected to be uh, very unstable. So once it is created, it will immediately decay into other particles, just, such as a pair of uh, photons or four electrons, as shown by the uh, animation on the right. So while we could not have the Higgs boson stay there, we could still reconstruct this Higgs boson by adding up uh, those final state particles. And you will see how the added up signal look like very soon. So it sounds like we know how to create Higgs boson and how, how we could detect a Higgs boson. So searching for Higgs boson should be easy, right? Well, actually this is far from the case. So to explain the challenging we are facing, imagine you are sitting now in front of uh, this very long street. And I tell you that I believe Professor Higgs lives on this street. However, I do not know his house number, but and now I want you to find the Professor Higgs for me. So this is, of course, a very irritating request, but this is exactly uh, the difficulty we are facing when searching for Higgs boson. Just like we do not know the house number of Professor Higgs, we do not know the mass uh, of the Higgs boson. So effectively, what we could do is to go down this street and knock on the door one by one to see where the Higgs boson is. And in the reality, uh, what I mean is that we need to build a very sophisticated accelerators and also particle detectors that can easily occupy hundreds or even thousands of physicists. And that project may last several decades. And in the end, there's no guarantee that you will find the Higgs boson in the end because your facility may only be able to reach halfway to the street well, Higgs boson could be living at the very end of the street, so you will completely miss it. So this is really tricky to find Higgs boson. So just to give you an idea of on the scale of the project we are talking about, we have looked for Higgs boson on the large electron positron collider at CERN. So it is a 27 kilometer long collider uh, at the border of uh, Swiss and France. And we have also looked for Higgs boson on Tevatron at Fermilab in Illinois, US. So this is a six kilometer long uh, circular collider and it is colliding proton with antiproton instead of the electron and the positron like a lab. So both uh, accelerators have managed to exclude a very large mass range where the Higgs boson could live, but neither uh, accelerator could find the Higgs boson in the end. Of course, it is a great pity, but let me make one very important clarification here. So for larger accelerators like LAP and the Tevatron and also the LHC we will come to later, searching for Higgs boson is only one of its uh, many scientific goals, which I would say are equally important. For example, the LAP accelerator has, uh, has helped us to measure the properties of the W and the Z boson very precisely. And therefore it has helped us establish the standard model of particle physics as we know it today. And the Tevatron, on the other hand, uh, has discovered the top quark, which is the heaviest uh, particle uh, in standard model. So it is the third generation of quark, and it is almost as heavy as the gold atom. And the Tevatron uh, 
in the end also managed to have some first hint of the Higgs boson, although it could not uh, conclude as a discovery. So the baton was final, finally passed to the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, so if you look at this picture, you may find it familiar and you should feel so because Large Hadron Collider has recycled the 27 kilometer long tunnel uh, from lab. So you see when we build a, uh, such large uh, accelerators, we have done very careful planning uh, in order to not uh, waste the resources. So compared with, uh, the, compared with the lab collider, the LHC is accelerating our protons uh, so that it, we can reach a higher energy and go deeper into the street to look for Higgs boson. So the chance that we find Higgs boson is significantly larger. And also, if you look at the accelerator complex, you can see that we also have some small accelerators like the SPS, which was used to discover the WZ boson, if you still remember. Uh, so the reason is that accelerating particles is like launching a rocket. You cannot do it on one go. Instead, you have to do it in stages. So the protons will first be accelerated by smaller accelerators like SPS uh, to a reasonable energy. And then they will, they, will become, they will be able to be accelerated by the LHC. And here they will be accelerated to the final energy, which is the highest mankind has reached so far. And then they will be uh, collided at four collision points. And our experiment, the Atlas experiment, is at uh, one of the collision points. And there's also another experiment called the CMS experiment at the opposite side of the LHC ring. So you can take a CMS experiment as our respectful competitor who is basically working on the, on the same thing. Um, so there are actually many fascinating things about uh, LHC, which I could not uh, talk about today due to limited, uh, limited time. But if you come to visit CERN uh, in the future when the LHC is not operating, you could actually book a underground uh, tour to visit the real machine by yourself and you may be accompanied by famous physicists like the former director general of CERN. Uh, so if you have a, such a chance in the future, uh, definitely make sure you make a good use of it. Okay, now let's discuss the Atlas uh, detector. So uh, as you can see from the left plot, uh, it is a very gigantic detector. You can compare it to human, which are represented by the two tiny figures here. So Atlas experiment is a very versatile uh, experiment. It is not only able to look for Higgs boson, but also able to study many other interesting physics. So if you are interested in how Atlas detector works and uh, what are the other physics we are studying, you can check out the other videos made by my colleagues under this uh, Atlas YouTube channel. And the Atlas is not only the name of our experiment and our detector, but also the name of a big scientific collaboration consists of uh, 5,000 members uh, from 40 countries and regions all over the world. So in the right plot, you are only seeing a very small fraction of these 5,000 people. And among them, 3,000 scientists will sign their names in our scientific publications. So if you download the pub, uh, Atlas paper from the internet, uh, quite often you'll find out that uh, we have an even longer author list compared with the paper itself. Uh, well, the, this, uh, well, 5,000 people sounds a lot. Uh, all these experts are essential for building and operating an experiment uh, as complicated as Atlas. So when we start searching for Higgs boson uh, at the Atlas and also CMS experiment, we already inherited the knowledge uh, from lab and the Tevatron. So we already have a very good starting point. So that's great. However, looking for Higgs boson uh, is still not an easy task. The reason is that whenever LHC produces one Higgs boson for us, it will produce tons of other noises that we are not interested in. So looking for Higgs boson is really like looking for a needle from the, his, uh, from the haystack. And if you want to be quantitative, we are talking about looking for one needle out of one billion straws. So you can see how difficult our task is. And then now let me show you some uh, real data to see if you can find the Higgs boson by yourself. So in the left plot, we have the, the data looking for Higgs boson decay to two photons. And the, as you see the data grow, uh, remember the Higgs boson can show up anywhere on this smoothly falling spectrum. And indeed from time to time, we see such noises that look like a Higgs boson. But as data accumulate more and more, it becomes clear that we have something at 125 GeV. So this is the Higgs boson we have been looking for for decades. 
So this signal looks apparent by itself, but in science, we have to be rigorous and quantitative. So in order to discover, so in order to claim the discovery of the Higgs boson, we need to make sure that the chance we are fooled by those kind of uh, statistical fluctuation is less than one out of one million. So to achieve this goal, we will also need the help from other channels like Higgs boson can also decay to four electrons or four muons or two electrons to muon. And the data is shown in the right plot. So as you can see, as the data accumulates, you also start to see something at the same position as the excess uh, in the in the Higgs to uh, diphoton channel. Uh, and this, this gave us uh, more confidence that we have found the Higgs boson. Moreover, we have also seen uh, this access in other decay channels like the Higgs boson decay to a pair of W bosons. Uh, and the CMS experiments have also seen the access with a similar significance and, and at the, basically the same position. Uh, by the way, this is uh, the Atlas YouTube channel as a reminder, so I'm not going to show you any data from our competitor, but uh, all these observations uh, combined together really give us uh, full confidence that we have finally found the Higgs boson. So it is time for celebration. The discovery of the Higgs boson completed uh, the standard model. So that's the, last standard model, that's the last standard model particle we found. It is so inspiring that the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, was immediately awarded to uh, Francois Anglert and Peter Higgs uh, the next year after the discovery uh, was made. And the discovery was announced on July 4th, uh, 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2012, uh, as Katarina explained at the beginning. So three days from now, it will be the ninth anniversary of the Higgs boson discovery. So from this picture, you can you can see how it looks like when the Higgs boson discovery was announced. Uh, so you can see that uh, everyone is cheering. And if you were there uh, in this uh, historical event, I'm sure you will be influenced as well by the joy from heart from those uh, physicists. After all, it has, it has took more than half a century to look for Higgs boson uh, after the theory was first proposed. And as you can see from the picture, many of our colleagues are already at their very high age. And some of them even did not live long enough to see their work come into full power. So well, quite often our attention is on the leading physicists under the spotlight, like, like those who won the Nobel Prize, I think it is also important that we remember all these physicists who worked very hard to make this great discovery possible. Okay, after, dis after discovering the Higgs boson, of course, we did not just lay down to rest. Instead, this is just the starting point of uh, another journey. So physics is in the end an experimental science. So our knowledge in particular on something as fundamental and as important as Higgs boson has to be based on the experimental measurements. So the most important question, of course, is whether the Higgs boson is indeed providing mass to other fundamental particles as we have predicted. Uh, so if a particle, one particle is heavier than the other in standard model, it is because it has a stronger interaction with Higgs field. So we can actually measure the interaction strength between Higgs field and the different particles. And we can put those uh, interaction strengths in the summary uh, plot and ordered as a, ordered as a particle mass. So the blue dashed line uh, here is, is the standard model prediction. So you can see the interaction strength is rising uh, with particle mass. And then now let's see how our, how our data will look like. And the, the results I'm going to show you, by the way, are the latest results obtained by the Atlas experiment last time this year. And some of them are even obtained just a couple of weeks ago. So it is quite exciting to check those out. So we have first studied the interaction between W and Z boson with the Higgs boson. So as mentioned before, the W and Z bosons are very heavy. And indeed, we saw a very strong interaction uh, between them and the Higgs field. And it is in very good agreement with the standard model prediction. But this is still not enough. We also want to check how these building block particles uh, interact with Higgs boson. So we have uh, checked the third generation particles, which are the heaviest among all the generations, if you still remember. So 
For example, we have checked the how strong top quark interacts with the Higgs boson. So it is almost as heavy as the gold atom. And indeed, we see the strongest interaction with Higgs boson. And again, it is in good agreement uh, with the standard model. We have also checked the bottom quark, uh, which is the third generation down quark. And, it is, and we see a good agreement with standard model as well. And the bottom quark, by the way, is the particle that the Higgs boson will most likely decay to. So more than half of the time, the Higgs boson will decay to a pair of top quarks. In addition, we have also checked the uh, Higgs boson interaction with uh, the tau lepton, which is a third generation electron. And you see a good agreement with standard model as well. But this is still not enough. We want to get, co we want to get uh, closer to the first generation. Uh, particles that make up our everyday matter. So as an intermediate step, we have studied the second generation uh, building block particles. So we have studied the interaction between the Higgs boson and the charm quark. So because the second generation particles are lighter, their interaction with, uh, Higgs, with Higgs boson is also weaker. So it's more difficult to study in the experiment. So you can see that we still have very limited knowledge Although within the precision we have, it is uh, still agreeing with the Higgs boson. We have uh, then checked the Higgs boson interaction with muon, which is the second generation electron. So you can see that here we have a slightly more precise uh, measurement. And the muon, the mass of the muon, by the way, is already 1,000 times lighter compared with top quark. So it is like comparing a puppy with an elephant. But across such a wide mass range, you can see that the Higgs boson is doing its job uh, very well as what we have expected. So this plot itself is a, is a clear demonstration of the success of the standard model of particle physics. And it is also the signature plot of the Higgs boson. No any other particles will give you this kind of behavior other than Higgs boson. Okay, so what I just discussed is something we would predict from standard model. Could we also get some surprises by studying Higgs boson? This is, of course, a very plausible scenario as well. And let me explain to you uh, with two examples. When I talk about the standard model was this and that successful just now, oh, actually, one thing I did not tell you is that a standard model actually explains only 5% of the matter and energy in our universe. The remaining majority, 95%, Consists of uh, are composed of dark matter and the dark energy, and we have no clue of what they are. What we have no clue whatsoever what they are, but we can still speculate that dark matter is also composed of elementary particles, and these particles should have mass because dark matter show gravity. Uh, and we can further speculate that these particles' mass are also provided by the Higgs field, and if this is the case then we will be able to uh, observe Higgs boson produced in association uh, together with the dark matter particle, or the Higgs boson can decay to a pair of dark matter particles. So the dark matter is by definition invisible, even with a sophisticated detector as Atlas detector, but still we can infer dark matter presence by looking for the recoil uh, of other particles. Another interesting uh, possibility is that we could actually have uh, more than one Higgs boson. So the standard model actually did not forbid us from having more, one, uh, more than one Higgs boson. We introduced the one Higgs boson so far uh, just for simplicity. And as you can see from the previous slide, the, this Higgs boson is working very hard to do all the job. Uh, but in series, uh, which are the extension of the standard model, like a supersymmetry, there could actually be five Higgs bosons in total. So they will, they will have different roles and they will also have interplay uh, with each other. This theory is interesting because it can help us explain the nature of the dark matter and also help us explain the larger asymmetry we have seen between matter and the antimatter in the universe. Um, well, I do not have time to go through the detail of either the dark matter search or the supersymmetry search. If you are interested, you can check out the videos made by my colleagues on these two topics uh, under the Atlas YouTube channel as well. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes also, let me briefly explain to you the next steps. Before that, I want to introduce you a book called Beam Times and Lifetimes. So it is a book written by a sociologist who try to describe what kind of people we particle physicists are. Uh, so if you are curious uh, as well, uh, you can check out this book. And the reason I want to mention this book is, is because that as the title describes, the 
the professional life and also large of large of the large part of the personal life of particle physicists is built around the beam time of our accelerator. This is because we also this is because we always want to accumulate more data in order to study the Higgs boson as well as other uh, important physics well. So now imagine that I have an accelerator and it has around 10 years to give me some data. And you have a better accelerator that accumulates the same amount of data in just one year. Then of course I will envy you because you can then use the next nine years to travel around the world or do whatever you like. Well, I'm still still sitting in front of my accelerator to wait for data to come. So in order to make LHC such a better accelerator that can accumulate data at least five times faster, after 2027, the LHC will be upgraded into, into the so-called high luminosity LHC. So luminosity is, by the way, the quantity we describe how fast the, the accelerator can accumulate data. And then this high luminosity LHC is going to accumulate a large amount of data to, to just to give you an impression. The data we have analyzed so far, what I have just shown you is only 5% of the total data we plan to accumulate at LHC. So the majority of them will then be produced by the high luminosity LHC. And at that time, we will be able to measure the interaction strengths between Higgs boson and the different, uh, different fundamental particles to a precision of a couple of percent as you can see in the middle plot. And moreover, we are also being able to, we will also be able to discuss some, uh, uh, study some difficult process, like how strong, uh, like, uh, like the Higgs boson uh, pair production. So when I tell you at the beginning that it is difficult to look for Higgs boson uh, because we do not know uh, the Higgs boson mass, the deeper reason is that uh, we do not know the Higgs boson, how strong the Higgs boson uh, interact with itself because the Higgs boson mass is also provided by the Higgs field. So as you, as you can see, looking for one Higgs boson is already such a fuss. So looking for two Higgs boson would be even more difficult. So that's why we need a large amount of data uh, from the high luminosity LHC. And by the way, all, we already have some first results uh, from, from the from the study of this dihex uh, process. Well, it is not uh, conclusive. If you are interested, you can still uh, check out the details uh, from the Atlas News, which I believe will be posted under the description of this video. Okay, uh, so you may ask, uh, having a couple of percent of precision is good enough or not? Uh, the answer is no. The reason is that uh, by studying Higgs boson, we also want to identify uh, potential deviations from standard model. So that, is a dif so that is the difference between reality and the standard model that the standard model cannot explain. So the standard model is actually uh, not the ultimate theory that explains everything we believe. Uh, so we believe, and so there must be some new physics ahead waiting for us. And if we can find uh, such a such a difference between the standard model and our data, we will then start a revolution in physics, which is uh, more significant than anyone you, you know before. So this, it is really important that we measure the Higgs boson property as precisely as possible. So to achieve this goal, we can then not, we can then not rely on LHC. Instead, we have to build uh, new accelerators. So actually CERN has already started thinking about uh, uh, the future after the LHC. So what we are talking about is after uh, 2040 or 2050. So there are actually several proposals. One of them is the future circular collider, as you can see in the left plot. And so it is a 100 kilometer long uh, circular collider, which will even make the LHC look small. And you can see how it is compared with the Geneva city and also the Geneva lake. So this accelerator is, is able to accelerate and collide the electron and the positron so that it can produce Higgs boson in large amount for precision study. In addition, it can also accelerate protons and protons just like LHC, or it, it can accelerate proton and the electron and collide them together in order to look for a new physics at, in the higher energy regime. So another proposal we have is a compact linear collider. Uh, so you can see it, see that it is also a very large project if you compare it to the size of the Geneva Lake. So the advantage of the circular collider is that uh, you, can, you can confine your particles uh, in this ring and, uh, and, uh, and accelerate, it, accelerate this particle while it goes circles. And uh, you can also accumulate more and more particles at the same time. 
Uh, so the entire scene is very compact, but uh, as, as, as the cost, uh, whenever you force the particle to turn around in order to fit in this uh, orbit, uh, the particle will radiate out some energy. Uh, so this is called synchrotron radiation. So the synchrotron radiation is actually very helpful for other science like biology, but for the purpose of accelerating particle, it is pure waste of energy. But uh, you don't have this problem on the linear collider because you don't need to force the particle to, to turn its direction. Instead, it will just uh, go all the way straight to, until the collision point and it will get accelerated on its way. Another advantage of the linear collider is that you can increase its energy by just building it longer. Well, it will not be so trivial if you have a circular collider. So since the Higgs boson is such an important particle and, and also Higgs physics, physics is such a hot topic, uh, there are also other, some other countries uh, who, who express the interest to host the future collider. For example, Japan has proposed the, the International Linear Collider and China has proposed the Circular uh, Electron-Positron Collider. So both uh, accelerators will be able to accelerate and collide the electron and the posit positron so that we can focus on producing Higgs boson in large amount and study the Higgs boson uh, properties uh, very precisely. So that, that's, that's, that will give you an idea of the projects we have at CERN and all over the world, and you can uh, pick your favorite. Of course, the final decision will be made by the experts in the field as well as as well as uh, as a government from different nations who will be responsible for providing funding uh, for those projects. Okay, so let me conclude my presentation uh, with uh, this sculpture. So you can find it uh, immediately when you get off the tram station at CERN. So this sculpture is called the Wandering the Immeasurable. Uh, if you take a closer look at the sculpture, you can actually find a brief history of science written in the language of of the original culture this breakthrough was made. Uh, so while I do not claim that I understand art, this is definitely, definitely one of my favorite uh, sculpture. And, uh, and you can have different interpretations of this uh, sculpture, but to me, I think it nicely represented the spirit of CERN and science in general. So in spite of our difference uh, in nationality, language, uh, culture, and complexion, etc., we could always uh, come together to work uh, for the common good of the society. We could uh, uh, fabricate this ribbon of science uh, together, which represents the best part of humanity, and that will also uh, steer our common future. Well, during these difficult days, uh, we have to stay remote. I hope one day in the future, we will be able to meet you in front of this statue uh, at CERN uh, uh, when it is safe to travel again. So until then, uh, please take care and stay healthy. So thank you. Thank you so much, Hong Tao. Um, that was such an interesting talk and you really did a great job at talking us through the long history of the discovery of the Higgs boson because it really did take many decades. So we're gonna have a Q&A session now. So if you're in the YouTube chat live, uh, feel free to add your questions in now. We also took some earlier today on Instagram. So we'll be starting with some of those. Um, Hong Tao, maybe you want to uh, stop sharing if you can, great. Sure. Um, so starting with some from Instagram, uh, here's a nice one. It, they're asking how impactful was the Higgs boson discovery to the entire field of physics? Okay, so that's a very good question. So as we mentioned during the presentation, so Higgs boson is the last particle that was found in standard model. So by discovering Higgs boson, we have completed the standard model of particle physics. And in the next a few, few decades, which will be basically my entire career, we are going to study uh, the Higgs boson to as high precision as possible because it is a, a very important particle. Uh, but at the same time, we also believe that the standard model is not the ultimate theory uh, that can explain everything. For example, we still do not understand the, the neutrino mass and we still do not understand the dark matter. So we believe there's new physics that could explain those phenomena that cannot be covered by standard model out there for us to discover. So for the longer term, we will also need to explore uh, those unknown territories. So this time we will not have something as solid as standard model to get our direction, but this also makes things uh, more interesting. I mean, that 
kind of ties in nicely to another question we received, um, which was asking if the Higgs boson decays to dark matter. So kind of looking beyond the standard model, could that be, could that be a possibility? Yes, that's definitely a possibility. So uh, as we discussed uh, just now, if the dark matter particles mass is also provided by the Higgs field, and if the dark matter, dark matter particle is light enough, then, it can, then the Higgs boson can definitely decay to a pair of, uh, of dark matter particles. Actually, in the experiment, we have been uh, searching for this kind of signature. And our cu uh, current best knowledge is that uh, the chance the Higgs boson decay to a pair of dark matter should not be higher than 9%. Um, so we will uh, need to add more data in order to further either further reduce this uh, probability or we will be able to see Higgs boson decay to dark matter. But on the other hand, uh, what to, even if we see something like look like dark matter, we still need the, the confirmation from uh, other experiments that directly detect the dark matter or look for the decay products of dark matter. So with the observation of all these different experiments combined together, we will then hopefully finally pin down what dark matter is. That's the dream, yeah. Um, so I guess tying into the questions about matter, um, there's a really nice one about the Higgs itself, the Higgs boson itself. So if it adds mass to matter, what makes the Higgs boson out of nothing? A subparticle? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one yeah. to talk about the mass of the Higgs boson and the Higgs field giving mass. Yeah, so uh, actually here, I think we need to uh, make a distinction uh, between the Higgs boson and the Higgs field. Uh, so Higgs field is, for example, like a pond. And if you throw a stone into the pond, it will, uh, it will stimulate some wave. And so this wave is like Higgs boson. So in other words, the Higgs boson is the excitation of the Higgs field and it gain mass uh, by, intera by interacting with the Higgs field. Uh, and uh, concerning whether the Higgs boson is made of some subparticles, so according to the standard model, currently, uh, our apparent, currently our best understanding is that all these elementary particles are point-like particles. So we do not know their actual size, but uh, with the advancement of the technology, maybe in the future, we will be able to probe its uh, inner structure, just like what we have done for understanding the proton structure. Yeah, that would be the dream. So um, there's another question here, which is, is the Higgs boson the only possible answer to the quote unquote mass problem? Uh, so that, that is not the case. Uh, actually, we also have some other theories which could uh, uh, also address the mass problem. But uh, the, Higgs boson, uh, the, the, the Higgs boson is uh, definitely uh, the most uh, most natural solution. And uh, since it has been found and it has been found to be working for for so many fundamental particles we have found so far. So I think, uh, yeah, it should at least explain the large fraction of them. Uh, so, so, so far we still do not know where the neutrino mass uh, is coming from. So it could be from the Higgs mechanism for, or from something else. Mm -hmm. And also we do not know dark matter as just discussed. So yeah, I'm not sure that Higgs boson can explain everything yet, but uh, we will see uh, with more measurements performed in the future. It's done very well so far. But yeah, there's still a lot yeah. pending. So another question, why can't we calculate its mass, so the Higgs boson's mass, from the standard model directly? So like, why did we have to explore that whole street? Why didn't we know where he lived? Yeah, yeah, this is also a very good uh, question. So I think one of the reasons we don't believe standard model is the ultimate theory is because that the standard model contains uh, many free parameters that it itself cannot predict. So you have to measure it from the experiment and then use it, use it as input for this theory. So the Higgs boson mass or the Higgs boson self-interaction strength is one of those part, is one of those free parameter. Mm -hmm. So the standard model itself have basically has zero predicting power uh, for, for this parameter. So that's, make, that's why searching for Higgs boson uh, took so long and is so uh, difficult. And in addition, the other uh, free parameters of the standard model also include the mass of all these building block particles I, I just mentioned. So yeah, you, so therefore we believe that there is probably a more fundamental theory that can explain uh, the mass of Higgs boson and all these particles and we are still yet we still need to uh, confirm uh, or find such a theory uh, by doing our research in both experiment and theory. Um, so, I mean, in, in, in the spirit of researching further, there's a question here about um, anti, 
antiparticles. So could the Higgs boson have its own antiparticle? Um, yes, uh, so the antiparticle of Higgs boson is itself. So it is not like a proton or, or, or electron. So there are antiparticles uh, are called the antiproton or positron, which will carry a different, uh, will carry the opposite charge and, and the same mass. And when they meet, they will an annihilate with each other. So Higgs boson, it doesn't have such a, another particle to, uh, to annihilate with. So it's antiparticle is just itself. So I think maybe it'd be good to talk a little bit about more about bosons in general on that, yeah. that spirit. So there's another question about um, the, asking about the difference between vector and scalar bosons and why is the Higgs a scalar boson? And I guess also, why is that important? Why is that a thing we're even talking about? Okay, yeah, so that's also a very good question. So there are two types of uh, fields uh, in nature. So one is called a vector field. So it is like a wind. So when we talk about the wind, it not only has a strength uh, quantified, for example, by kilometer per hour, uh, but uh, also a direction, like uh, which direction this wind is blowing. Uh, so and the, and the, the quantum particles associated uh, uh, with uh, this uh, vector field, like a photon and WZ boson and the gluon, will have it will have some kind of orientation. Like we know, photon has polarization, and the Higgs field, on the other hand, is predicted to be a scalar field. Uh, otherwise, it cannot do its job properly. Uh, so the scalar field is like a temperature or humidity. So when we talk about temperature or humidity, we only mention how high it is. We don't mention uh, any information about the direction. Uh, so if the Higgs boson uh, is a, if the Higgs field is a scalar field, then the Higgs boson is a scalar particle. And if we uh, look at the decay products of the Higgs boson, for example, if the Higgs boson decay to two photons, we will then be able to see this photon flying out uh, uniformly in all directions without any preference. Well, if the Higgs boson is not a scalar particle, then you will see some preference. So indeed, in experiment, we have verified that it's, it is in, the, what we see, uh, the Higgs boson is this no preference uh, case. So we can confirm that the Higgs boson uh, is a scalar particle as predicted by the standard model. And the first is also- Yeah, an, an and the, yeah it is the only scalar yeah. particle we have that in was, the standard model. Yes. That was in, in 2012 during the discovery, that was one of the big things that, uh, that yes. everyone was excited about. Um, so kind of a little bit more of a detailed question. So it, it reads, uh, why is the 125 GeV peak so broad? So going back to that plot you showed of the discovery, um, and then the question goes on, according to its lifetime, shouldn't it be much sharper? That's, that's also a very good question. So indeed, the, uh, the true Higgs boson uh, width should be very sharp. It is only 4 MeV. Uh, but uh, for experiment at LHC, we those, uh, those detectors only have very limited resolution, so it cannot see this uh, very narrow peak clearly. Instead, it will see something which is smeared out by the uncertainty of detecting the uh, uncertainty of the uh, detecting these uh, particles. So this broad structure we are seeing is basically this uh, due to the limited resolution of our detector. Um, so. This is a kind of not quite a question, more of a general uh, question about your uh, uh, some of the, the the history of the Higgs boson discovery. So they want to know more about the discovery of the Higgs boson decaying to two muons. So that specific decay channel. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Uh, actually, first of all, just to clarify, we have not discovered the Higgs boson decay to two muons yet. We only, we so far only has uh, evidence. So by evidence, I mean that uh, there's a one out of 1000 chance that uh, we could be fooled by the fluctuation from the, the data. Well, for discovery, if you still remember, we will need a, a chance of one out of 1 million. So that's, that's a much higher requirement. And the searching for uh, the Higgs boson decay to a pair of muon uh, is very challenging. It is because uh, because the muon has only very weak interaction with the Higgs boson, so the signal is very small. On the other hand, you have a lot of uh, noise, which will basically make the signal like a tiny, tiny little island sitting on the ocean of noises. So to in order to uh, look for Higgs boson decay to a pair of muon, 
we have used uh, some very advanced uh, machine learning technologies uh, in order to uh, squeeze out uh, as much information as possible from our data. And we have also introduced the innovations, for example, on how to model this ocean of, uh, of noises in order to isolate, isolate out this small island uh, of Higgs signal. So in the end, uh, the ATLAS and the CMS experiments are able to uh, claim the evidence, which is one out of 1,000 chance of being wrong. Uh, for his to me, mu decay, and with more data uh, coming out from next year onward, we will hopefully be able to finally discover this process. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you, you covered that a little bit in your um, towards the end of the presentation. But when we get more data, a lot of these things that have these error bars should hopefully be reduced. Yes. So we're going to try to only cover a few more questions since we're coming up onto the hour. Um, so this. Next one ties into this kind of future, future of physics and future of um, the LHC. So the question is, what is the future of physics focus beyond the standard model and the Higgs? And can you give us your point of view on that? Uh, yes, so I think there are currently several unknowns uh, that the standard model cannot explain. Uh, so one of them is uh, the neutrino mass. So we need to understand uh, why the neutrino has mass uh, uh, and also whether there's any CP mixing uh, in, the in the neutrino sector. Uh, so I think this is uh, one, of the high, uh, one of the very hot topic uh, for the next few years. And also we need to, uh, to look for dark matter. We need to confirm the existence of dark matter and understand uh, what, it, what it is. So that's a, another direction. And also uh, I think we need to understand the large asymmetry uh, between uh, matter and the antimatter in the universe. So that will require us to look for additional uh, CP violation uh, sources. Uh, and the, what we know from standard model is too, just uh, too little to explain such a large asymmetry. Uh, so we have been looking for this uh, in, in Higgs uh, physics actually, but also in, in other areas. Yes, I, I think that's, that's just a small selection of all these uh, interesting and exciting developments uh, which are happening now. So, yeah. I mean, it's uh, maybe that's not something that always comes across, but the Higgs is also a tool for these searches beyond the standard yes, model. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So speaking on in, in terms of the future, um, our last question I think for today um, will be, what is your personal view on the future of high energy physics, specifically collider physics? And are you optimistic about the development in the field? What with it getting harder um, to keep exploring down some of these streets that we, going back to your earlier metaphor? Yes, uh, I think this is a very interesting question. I think in the past, uh, I, saw, I saw a meeting record from back to, I believe, 1970s, which was the, which was said, people say the golden age of the particle physics, where we made a lot of discoveries. But even at that time, uh, the particle physics are concerned about their future and thinking that they may run into funding issues and they may not have enough attention, et cetera. But we know after that, we still made quite some important breakthroughs. So I'm, yeah, that being said, I think I'm optimistic about the future of uh, particle physics. So as an immediate next step is that, we, is that we should build a Higgs factory that focuses on producing the Higgs boson so that we can study the Higgs boson property very carefully, uh, just like what we have done for the WNZ boson. So this will hopefully open us a portal to explore the new physics, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, by looking for the deviations uh, between the measurement and the standard model. And beyond that, uh, there are so many unknowns uh, we just mentioned time, time and time again. So, and I think all this will need a solution. And the, and the accelerator, uh, the collider physics is one, the most efficient way we know so far to, to explore them. So yeah, I think those questions will need, will need to be addressed by one of the future accelerators as well. Yeah, I mean, we have many decades, I think, of um, yeah. not just collider physics ahead of us, but also of LHC and ATLAS physics. Of course, us, yes, hopefully. yes, at least for the next uh, 20 or 30 years. So yeah, this will yeah. be our flagship of exploring the nature. Exactly. Well, um, that's it for this evening or morning, no matter where you are. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yang, for joining us and uh, tune in 
to everyone who's watching, I suggest that you tune in to our next series of um, YouTube live events coming throughout the year. So there's also a number that we've done so far. We've talked a lot about dark matter today. There's been one on dark matter. So you can also go check that out. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.